Hi, this is Phil at Simply Rhino. In this short beginner level video, I'll be looking at the new and improved solid modeling tools in Rhino 8. Last year, I created a couple of videos exploring how Rhino could be used like SketchUp, and here I'm looking at how these new tools further simplify that process. These new tools include Push Pull, Inset Face, Auto Seaplane, and Improvements to the Gumball. I'm going to look at creating this simple building that I've built for our recent Rhino Sun and Sky Render video. And the starting point for this is these 2D plan and elevational drawings. The building is symmetrical left to right and has some common details on the end elevations. The first task is to create the walls and here I've got the completed walls with cutouts for the stone sills, window frames and glass all of which can be modelled later and placed on their own layers. My starting point for these walls would be a solid from which I can first create the wall thickness and then the cutouts. I'll create a new layer called New Solids and then a sub-layer for the walls and make this active. I'm going to start by defining the outer boundary in plan by drawing a rectangle referring to the existing 2D drawings. In the perspective view, I can then turn on the gumball, making sure the alignment is set to C-plane, and extrude this rectangle to the desired height by left-clicking on the blue extrusion dot and typing 3000 into the dialog box that appears. On pressing enter, the command completes. Note that I get a solid by default when extruding a closed boundary with the gumball. This behaviour is new in Rhino 8. To create the pitched roof, I'm going to split the top surface of the solid. I'll run the Line tool and first make sure that the mid snap is enabled before snapping the start of the line to the midpoint here and the end of the line to the midpoint here. Next, I'll go to the Solid Tools tab and open up this new toolbar container here, which is called Push Pull. This contains a couple of older tools, one of which is split plane of face. I'll run this, pick the face to split, and then use the Select Curves option to select the line and enter. The top face is now split into two. Now I can use Subobject Selection, Shift, Control, Left Click, to pick the edge and pull that edge up to create the ridge. I'll click on the blue arrow, input a value of 2000 and enter. To hollow out this solid leaving a wall thickness, I can use a combination of two new tools. I'll spin the model so I'm looking at the underside of the building. Next, I'll choose Inset Face Edges, select this face, enter, make sure the split option is set to No and set the inset distance to 300. When I hit enter to finish the command, I'll create a polyline that lies on the selected face. I've chosen not to split the face here. The curve is all I need. I'll now turn off the gumball for clarity and pick the push pull tool. I'll click inside this area here and pull to create the cavity, moving the preview through the solid and left clicking to finish the command. I've now got the basic wall structure modelled with a consistent 300mm thickness and the next task is to create the cutouts or openings in the side elevation here. I'm going to make use of the existing 2D drawing, so I'll turn on the 2D reference layers and turn off the dimensions for clarity. Next, I'll select the side elevation on the 2D drawing and copy this onto the current layer. So, right-click on my Walls layer and choose Copy Objects to Layer. Now, I can turn off the 2D reference layers. To place the 2D drawing accurately on the 3D side elevation, I can use Orient 3 points from the Transform menu. I'll run the command and select the objects that I want to orient, so the three windows and maybe this line here, and then press Enter. Next, I can select the three reference points, so 1, 2 and 3, 
and then I click on the three target points here. And once the first point is set, and assuming the scale option is set to no, the other two points just describe the orientation. So I can click on the end points of the wall edges. I can then delete the remaining parts of the copied 2D drawing that I haven't oriented. I'll now turn on Auto Seaplane, which is a new feature in Rhino 8. Make sure the sticky option is on and sub-object select the elevation face to align the seaplane to it. Before moving on, let's have a more detailed look at Auto Seaplane. If I turn Auto Seaplane on and right click to go into the options, we have first of all the sticky option. If I use sub-object selection to pick the elevation here, the seaplane will append itself to this face and if I deselect the face, the seaplane will only change when I pick another object. If I turn off the sticky option, the seaplane will append as previous, but when I deselect the face, the seaplane will return to the default seaplane, in this case, world top. I've created another object that isn't aligned to world XYZ in order to look at the other auto seaplane options, align to object, align to world, and align to view. The align to object option is going to attempt to align the X and Y axis of the seaplane to the object, in this case the face selected. If I switch to align to world, then the XY alignment more closely relates to world coordinates. So you can see here that the X axis is parallel to world X and the seaplane Y axis conforms to world Z. Finally, if I switch to align to view, then the X and Y axis attempt to align to the view at the time the seaplane is set. These alignment options are important in an architectural context, as, for instance, if I have the alignment set to object, then the axis directions are informed by the UVN directions of the surface I select, and this is not guaranteed to be consistent. Here, the Y axis is pointing upwards when I select this face, and is rotated 90 degrees when I select this face. So this would obviously rotate any plan views generated from this seaplane. Switching to Align to World avoids this problem and the Y axis is now consistent as I select different faces. Finally, even if I have the sticky option selected and pick a face, when I select an object on that face and run a command, for example copy, this will move the seaplane relative to the object being worked on. I can avoid this by locking the auto seaplane, either by selecting lock from the options or by clicking on the padlock symbol. The seaplane will now remain fixed even if I sub-object select a face on a different plane. Going back to the model and with the seaplane appended to the elevation, I'll select this line work and lock it. Then I can trace around the boundary by using a polyline and making sure the end snap is selected. Next, I can select the polyline and copy it across, snapping it into position. To create the cutouts, I can use push-pull. When there is more than one boundary, I'll see this highlighted region which previews the selection that I can confirm by pressing Enter before pulling through the walls to create the cutout. Because the elevations are symmetrical, I can cut through both walls at the same time. Finally, I can unlock the 2D reference and delete all the line work. Before moving on with the building, I'd like to look at a couple of new features in Rhino 8. First of all, I can see the isocurves on each of the planar faces in the solid here. This was default behaviour in previous versions, but this is an option in Rhino 8 and is handled on a per display mode basis. The setting for this is fairly well hidden and is accessed by going to Rhino Options and selecting View. From here it's Display Modes, Open Up Shaded, then Objects and then Surfaces. From here I can choose to show or hide the isocurves on flat faces. 
This setting is off by default and needs to be set for each display mode. With regard to creating the cutouts, I could, of course, use wire cut rather than push pull to create these. And the wire cut behavior is now incorporated into the gumball in Rhino 8. If I turn on the gumball and choose the Align to Object option before selecting one of the polylines, I'll see this new feature. Between the transform arrow and the extrusion dot on the blue axis, I'll see a line. If I drag with the gumball from this line icon, I'll enable the wire cut behavior. Although the push pull and wire cut tools have some overlap, there are instances where one or other may be preferable or indeed produce different results. So I can create the remaining cutouts by using the same process of copying the relevant 2D line work, applying it to the elevation by using Orient 3 points, and then using either push pull or the gumball wire cut to create the perforations. Next, I want to create the floor plate, so I'll create a new layer for this and make it active. I'll then trace around the inside edge of the base of the wall with a polyline, closing this up across the door threshold. Next, I'll extrude this upwards to create a solid, and if I choose the snappy dragging option, I can snap the height accurately to the doorstep cutout. To create the step, I'll use push-pull to pull out the step by a distance of 300 millimeters. Note that although this previews like the existing extrude face or gumball extrude tools, where the new edges and faces are created, push-pull automatically cleans up these coplanar faces. Next, I'm going to create the roof, and if I turn on the existing component, this will show what I'd like to build. The eaves extend by 300 millimeters, and the thickness as modeled here is 150 millimeters. I'll create a new layer for the roof and make it active. Rather than using the 2D drawings as a starting point, I'm going to build the roof more directly from the existing wall geometry. I'll turn the Auto C plane on and then go to Curve, Curve from Objects and Duplicate Edge. I'll duplicate the two top outer edges of the wall and this will give me two lines. I'll use the Join tool to make these into a polyline. I can then offset the polyline with the cap option set to flat and the extrude distance set to 150 millimeters. This will create a closed polyline that I can then gumball extrude outwards to a distance of 300 millimeters. Now I can use push pull to lengthen the roof, first snapping to the end of the wall here and then repeating the command to add the 300 mm eaves overhang. Once again, note how push-pull automatically cleans up the coplanar faces, creating simple geometry. Finally, I can add the 300 mm eaves overhang to the long edge of the roof, again by using push-pull. The stone sills should be pretty simple. I'll use Auto C-Plane to append the C-Plane to this elevation and then create a corner-to-corner -corner rectangle, snapping to the cutout in the wall. I'll then move this rectangle outwards from the wall by the required distance of 120 millimeters. And then I can gumball extrude the sill inwards, snapping to the inside face of the wall. Having the snappy dragging gumball option enabled will help here. Then, working from the inside of the building, I can use push-pull to extend the sill inwards by 120 millimeters. Next, I can copy the other two sills into place on the starting elevation and use mirror from the transform menu to create the sills on the opposite elevation. A good tip here is that if the building is centered around the world top seaplane axis, then I can use the Y axis option in the mirror command to ensure accurate placement. Finally, I can use Orient 3 points to copy a sill onto the end elevation before copying its neighbor into place. Let's look next at the window frames and again 
I'm using similar techniques here. I'll create a corner to corner rectangle snapping to the window frame aperture. I'll temporarily turn off the wall layer for clarity and then I can use Gumball Extrude to create a 70mm deep solid. I'll then move this inwards by 60mm so that the frame is recessed into the wall. The rectangle can be deleted and I'll then use Inset Face to create a 60mm inset with the split option set to No. I'll right click to repeat the last command and create a similar inset on the inside of the rectangular solid. I'll then use Push-Pull to push a 10mm recess into each side of the frame. As before, I'll copy and orient the glass boundary curves onto this recessed face and then I can use Push-Pull to create the inner frame detail. Next, I'll create a new layer for the glass and make this active before selecting the six boundary curves and using the gumball to extrude these to a depth of 6mm to represent the glass. Note that I can extrude multiple boundaries at the same time. To move the glass to the centre of the frame, I'll use the Move tool rather than the gumball. I'll turn off the gumball, run Move and find the midpoint of the thickness of the glass as the point to move from. I'll start to move in an ortho-constrained direction and then hit the Tab key to constrain that direction. I can then snap the cursor onto the middle of the frame as the point to move to and the glass is now located centrally within the frame. One of the things that could be helpful here is that when I look at this in either the monochrome or arctic display modes, the glass appears opaque. However, if I select all the items on the glass layer and apply a glass material to them, then I'll see that the monochrome and arctic modes understand transparent materials. And this can significantly improve visualization. To create the round window apertures, frames and glass, I can use similar techniques to previous. And for the roof trusses, I can again place the 2D curves into position on the model and extrude them with the gumball. Here, I'm using a number of centrally positioned closed polylines and to extrude both sides from the center, I can hold down shift before typing in a value of 60. This will extrude the curve 60mm each side, giving a total thickness of 120mm. So, with just a few tools and some simple steps, I've been able to create an accurate solid model that can be used for design, evaluation and development. Because Rhino uses industry standard NURBS geometry, this model can easily be shared with all other popular architectural software. That's about all I wanted to cover in this video. Thanks for watching and please feel free to leave any comments below. If you found this video useful, then please hit the like button and remember that to keep up with the latest developments in Rhino, you can subscribe to this channel. At Simply Rhino, we offer training for Rhino and all its key plugins, so check out our website for more details. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.